Hello everyone, my name is Concetta Spitaleri. I am director at the iWoman Global Awards and I welcome you all today to this first series of our Facebook Live series of iWoman Global Awards edition of 2020, which are made to share with the winners. Today we have our first special guest who is Dr. Terio Rossi from Oyo, the United States. She's the winner of the section Women Iconic a woman of I Woman Global Awards of 2020. Dr. Terio Rossi is currently a faculty member and director at Boonshoft School of Medicine, part of the Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Her subject matter is Homeland Security. She's a researcher, a speaker, and a published author, and much, much more we could just say in so little words. We are really so honored to share this session with you today, Dr. Terry. Before leaving the floor to our special guest, just allow me a couple of minutes to introduce myself. So my name is Concetta. I am Italian and I live in Brussels, the heart of Europe, in Belgium. I am an entrepreneur and I am a mother of two fabulous children. I am an hyperactive entrepreneur woman, always in search of opportunities to improve my life purposes, but especially very important for me, the one of those who are in need. My background is um, very strong. I have more than 15 years at top executive level in, a, in a multinationals. And seven years ago, ago I took the heroic <laughs> initiative of build my own business, which is uh, in the flower business. So uh, which of course, today with the, with the pandemic is suffering a little bit. And since this, uh, let's say the economic part of the business has been put on hold, I have reflected on the real priorities of life and created a fantastic initiative which is connected with the Iwoman Global Awards and is called the Will of Tribe, which is a platform mainly made of women that attempt to create a perspective on how the world should be, why we promote diversity and we encourage resilience. Today is so important to become or to be resilient in the life we in the moment that we live. The goal has gathered top executive, personalities, diplomatic representative, royal families members, entrepreneur and investors from all backgrounds all around the world to make this happen. So our motto is we innovate, we resist and we win. And this is precisely why I'm very happy to have accepted the role of being director of the iWoman Global Awards because we share the same values, the same ethics. The program is 100% transparent and this is what is important for us, really to share the same values and to, to share the same goals. So, um, well, I think I've said enough. I would like to thank all the people who have given me the opportunity to share and give, of course, the place now to our special guest. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, we are very happy to have you here. Please, Dr. Terry. Thank you, um, Conchetta and, and for and iGlobal um, Awards. I am, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to share some of my life experiences with you. I'm going to give you a little bit of behind the scenes right now. I'm used to looking down as opposed to up, so I want you to know I have an arrow on my computer. So audience, if you notice I looked down at my computer, it's by habit, and I've asked Conchata, please tell me, look back yes, up. I will, I will. <laughs> Um, uh, I am a, an assistant professor at our medical school and a subject matter expert in Homeland Security. And you may wonder how someone with Homeland Security background would end up in a medical school. Well, with COVID happening right now, it's probably not that unusual. But up until recently, when I would say I'm a Homeland Security expert in, in a medical school, people always ask why. So what I thought I would do is give you just a few and by few I mean 27 bullet points on my <laughs> life to where I got here today and um, and then hopefully you can ask me some questions and please at any time feel free to ask questions to interrupt because I'd prefer to have this more of a back and forth dialogue than me just going on and on and on. Um, I'm also a big coffee drinker so you may notice I will occasionally take a drink of my coffee. Good. Um, yeah, <laughs> I haven't started. Uh, and I am from a small town in Iowa. I was in the middle of the United States and my town is called Muscatine and it's right on the Mississippi River. And some of you may be from small towns like this, so you understand. 
when you grow up in the town, it's great and wonderful to raise kids, but as a kid, you start wanting to, uh, to branch out. You want more. And while I did spend quite a few summers at, um, you know, Kids Smart Camp at the University of Iowa, which is near me, um, I did want more and I wasn't ready at that time to jump straight into school when I graduated high school. So I went to the recruiter, uh, to the army recruiter, uh, because I liked the uniform. And um, that's a little bit of a joke, but not 100%. And, and I told the recruiter I wanted to learn to be tough because I was a bit of a, a girly girl. And so they showed me this beautiful picture in Germany and working outdoors. And I thought it was lovely because I forgot that, you know, it gets cold there. It gets really cold. But I did end up going to Germany. And while I was there, I was part of the NBC team, which is now called CBRN. And that is Chemical, Radiolo Chemical Biological Radiological Nuclear uh, Defense. So I started this early on when I was in the military in Germany. It's also where I learned to drink coffee because it gets really cold there. Um, I knew all along that I was gonna to go to college. I just wanted to delay it a little and get some life experiences. So I did end up um, going to New Jersey, not really a life experience. I, I was stationed in Washington State, loved it. And I was down in Texas. So I, I really got to experience quite a bit within my country. But then also when I was in Germany, I got to travel around Europe. Um, after I ended up getting married in Germany to another, um, to another soldier and he was from Dayton, Ohio. And that's how I ended up here in Dayton, Ohio. I immediately, you know, we, we started a family. I have a son and a daughter and I went to school at Wright State because I was set, you know, I had to stay in Dayton, Ohio. I ended up doing my, my bachelor's degree, evolutionary biology, biology degree. And then I did my master's in molecular biology. I immediately got hired as an adjunct faculty in the biology department. And then I transitioned from there over to my current department. And that was in 2003 uh, in pharmacology and toxicology. So I was a staff scientist doing molecular genetics work, um, enjoyed my job. And then I was asked by my chair to take on a couple administrative roles. I had already experienced um, was part of a project as a grad student working on something that helped create a, giving access to, to laboratories for science students with, with disabilities. And so I ended up then helping with a program called Streams, which, which brings in underrepresented minorities to help them in STEM fields. And then with my master's program, and I was there as an assistant director. In 2008, my, my chair called me in and said, you're director. I, my only experience, I had very limited experience and I was working, ready to work on my PhD. And now all of a sudden I'm an administrator and the boss. And I was a little nervous. Oh, yeah, I see your eyes. Yes, that's exactly how I felt. Um, so I, I ended up getting, it was recommended to me that I do this other doctorate program as opposed to the, the, um, the biomedical sciences. And that was in organizational leadership, organizational studies. And this really resonated well with me because when I would go into my faculty, and I'll probably have a few faculty watching this, I love you all. Um, when I would go in there and I would have a project done and I'd be like, this is what I want. And, and they would find problems with it. I was like, but you don't have to do anything. I'm coming to you with this, with this completed thing, completed idea. You don't have to teach. It's just gonna bring in money. And they found fault. And so the program that I was interested in taught me that um you know you have to get buy-in they have to have authorship all these skills that i never had as a scientist so i immediately jumped ship and went into this new degree and i've never never regretted it it was a wonderful program wonderful degree um, my doctorate work was on high stakes decision making for crisis leadership and right before that i had started a cbrn certificate program and so that was that was really helping with uh, crisis decision making. I ended up starting a, a think tank, a Dayton regional think tank with our mayor, Nan Whaley, um, in 2016. And 
so my life does get a little back and forth, back and forth in terms of dates. Um, so we started this think tank. I don't know if you know this yet, but last year, no, last year we had like eight tornadoes. We had a KKK rally. We had an active shooter. Uh, we had so many things going on that our region was really spot in the spotlight. Um, I, at least nationally, if not internationally, because of all the stress put on us. Um, I also was, you know, back it up a little in 13, part of my first um, interaction and in work, working with the FBI, and that was to have an FBI bioacademic safety workshop. And then, uh, so time progresses. I, <laughs> I uh, ended up helping them again with another, another project in 2016. I, I was at one of my think tank meetings and I said I was really interested in electromagnetic pulse. One of, one of my colleagues said, oh, you need to go out and talk to the people at InfraGuard. Now, InfraGuard is a FBI public sector partnership. And the whole goal behind that is protecting the infrastructure of our country. So you have people from a variety of backgrounds all you know, going to these meetings, partnering up with the FBI. And so I went to my first meeting and I thought, this is great. This is exactly what I needed. They, they immediately put me on the board and sent me to give a talk on crisis decision making. And I came back. And so that really started my involvement with, work, with working with them. Um, I ended up doing a, I'm gonna pause and let you ask me a question if you have a question. Do you? No? Okay. Um, so then I ended up. <laughs> maybe, maybe have a drop of coffee. Maybe okay. have a drop coffee. of coffee. <laughs> Somewhere in I... there, I did my first book, which is behind me. Um, and my first book I did with, I was co-editor and contributing author. My my um, colleague was is Dr. Larry James. Dr. Larry James was the Dean of the School of Professional Psychology here at Wright State. But before that, he was at Walter Reed. And before that, he was at Abu Ghraib. And before that, he was at Guantanamo Bay. He was the chief psychologist at Guantanamo Bay right after 9-11. And so as a psychologist, he was coming at the, the threat of terrorism from a psychology aspect, and I was and I was going at it with the the bio, you know, chemical threat aspect, and we decided to write a book on it, and and we did, and it was a three book deal. And the next book was on terrorism, and and so I ended up starting my research then on terrorism. And what I look at specifically is American citizens charged with terrorism since 9/11. So there's about 520 or so. And I looked at up to 50 different variables, and including the military, which is a big one. And that's pretty much my soapbox right now is what can we do to, you know, to stop the military from being recruited, military soldiers, airmen, um, and, and such from being recruited by groups like ISIS. And so I had the opportunity last year uh, I was I was giving a talk and my congressman was at my talk and he said, hey, Terry, can you go to Congress and talk to some congressional staff from the Armed Fo Forces Committee and the and the House Intelligence Committee about this topic? So I was I uh, of course I did this and it was it was um, a great experience, a little nervous. I had heels on. It was a bad day, but, you know, it was fun. And so we did that. I, I also got to tour tour some of um, behind the scenes um, in DC, and so that was a, a lot of fun. I then ended up going um, shortly after that back to Quantico because, or to Quantico, because I was part of a FBI Citizens Academy. So if you are a U.S. citizen and you're interested in this field, look, um, check it out. It is a it is is like Quantico training they have for FBI new agents, but it's meant for non-law enforcement personnel. And so I went through the academy. We we then ended up spending some time in DC at headquarters in Quantico and getting some additional training. And so I really have merged now. I, I'm, I'm sure it sounds like I'm everywhere, but I've really merged. I've got my academic life, which is directing programs and doing the terrorism research. 
I've got the FBI Citizens Academy, and then I have InfraGuard, which is also FBI. So while they all do kind of overlap, they're, it's, it's really nice. It's like the circle I belong to. And the circle includes military and industry and government and academics. And so that's, that's really what I'm pushing forward or what I push, push uh, toward. Now in 19, I was invited back to give another talk on terrorism with the same FBI group, um, InfraGuard, and as well as the International Security Group, ASIS. And at that meeting, I had someone from NSA attended my talk, and she asked if I would go and give training on terrorism to NSA. And so I did that. Uh, I also talked at Quantico. Let me just tell you, I, I had this really brilliant, not brilliant idea to drive to Washington, D.C. so that I wouldn't have to worry about getting through the, the gates and then drive up. And I envisioned this really beautiful day and driving and an audio book. And it was a nightmare. I'm driving from, from the NSA. First off, I pull out and accidentally go back in. And all of a sudden I have these people surrounding my car with weapons telling me to pull over. And uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare. And then it, it's late afternoon. By the time I get back on the road, the sun's going down, there's construction, it's DC traffic, it's raining. It was a mess. I called my mother. I spent the next 10 hours on the phone with my mom. And I think we both thought at some point I was gonna die. I mean, we were, were on toll roads and not toll roads. And I got off on the wrong because, you know, when you're on your phone, GPS doesn't talk. And I didn't want to hang up for my mom. So it was just a wonderful experience of a talk, but oh my gosh, the drive home was, was bad and I'm never going to drive that again. Uh, so anyway, that was really me swerving off topic, uh, bad memories. And uh, so, so that was 2019. I also, when I, when I spoke at Chicago, there were quite a few people that, that reached out to me. It was my first experience. Like I've given talks before and I've had a few people ask me for, you know, to autograph my books, but I literally had like a line going out the door. I had somebody from Facebook that ended up reaching out asking if it could, if he could use my uh, research, uh, my work um, on terrorism as part of their preventive, um, Facebook's prevent workplace violence program. And I had somebody from, from well, actually some things I can't talk about, but it was a really great experience. And, and I find that going out and giving these talks, the, the, what I get back is, is just amazing. Uh, then I, so that was late in 2019. And then in November, I was uh, invited to go back to Quantico for a, um, a leadership academy for, for InfraGuard leaders because I was vice president at that time. Now I had a variety of events that were planned for this year, but then COVID hit. And so while I have done a few like this through the internet, I have not traveled much, but I have been asked to go back to a few of those previous places. And I was made president of my Dayton chapter of InfraGuard. Again, if you want to know more information, um, on anything that I'm talking about, please reach out to me, um, find me on Facebook, find me on LinkedIn. You know how it is when you have a topic that you love and you talk about it to a point where nobody else wants to hear you talk about it? I think I'm at that stage with my family and friends. So if you want to talk to me about Homeland Security, if you want to talk to me about terrorism, if you want to talk to me about any of the things that I do, please reach out because I, I would be happy to do so. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, uh, Terry. Um, I mean, it's really a, it would take, I think, really a, a week when I also had the chance to go through your, uh, I mean, your achievements. It's just, it's just unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. But if you had to share with us, also as a person and as a woman, you know, we all have, you know, we are, uh, we are strong women. We, uh, of course, we live things in life that make us, you know, a, a kind of. Uh, experiences that make us change or make us think that you know this is the way to go what are the uh, stages maybe in your life just the most important ones or the most important one when you have really understood that it was the direction where you wish to go and that you all your path in life have led you to go could you maybe share this with us as a as a woman and as a human being of course <laughs> so 
I'd have to say my first challenge as a woman in a man's field was when I was in the army. And I was in a unit with only a couple females and, um, you know, maybe a hundred males. And I was, uh, I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And so sometimes males are not really good at keeping their distance, even if it's unwanted. And I had a situation where I had a superior approach me and in a very uncomfortable way. And when I asked, um, you know, when I, when I brought it up to, to our, to our leaders, it was a situation where they said, well, we can always send you to another unit. Um, so, you know, you, you have to work around those things. And this was in the, in the 1980s. Things have changed, I'm sure, since then. Uh, and I had a situation where I had a, a, one of my, one of my um, non-commissioned officers that did not believe a female should be there. So every chance he could, he did not let, he stopped me, prevented me from doing what I had to do to get promoted. So if I had to get a certain certificate or certain training, he made sure that he could, he, he did his best to stop me. But what was really lucky is I had a team, I had a unit that I, you know, my, my people that went out of their way. The guys that I worked with closely went out of their way to make sure that that they could they could open up the doors so that I could make those things happen. So, for example, if he was if he was gone for the day, they they let me push forward on things that w they would normally do. So I've had really good guys, really good people that I've worked with, and I've had some not so good people. And so that was really my experience in the military. Now, um, in the sciences, there's quite a few females in the sciences. But there are differences between how you're treated before you have your doctorate and how you're treated with without your doctorate. So, you know, I think we all experience those just in, in terms of our own careers. Um, but if you have to but, tell, if you have to tell, if you have to tell the woman or the, the young girls, you know, who are listening to you today, because this is what you are, you are a symbol. You are a symbol, this is why you are a, given an award today. You're a symbol an iconic woman if you have to tell them you know what to do i mean what kept you you know resisting if you have to tell them where you have, of course you have been you have been in this very uncomfortable position because you were a woman in a, in a, in a male orientated domain but if you have to give a piece of advice to these girls or to these you know future entrepreneur or leaders what would you say Terry? um i would tell them that i have had many times in my career where i have not been well liked because of how I am as a female, whereas if a male was in my same boat, they would have been called different names. Um, because I was in the army, 18, 19, those were my formative, you know, I spent four years starting at age 18, active duty, four years inactive. Those were my formative years. What did I learn? No excuse is a good excuse. You do what needs to be done to get the job done and, and you speak your mind. And those are traits that are really valuable for everybody, but those are not traits that everybody wants to hear. So I, you know, fast forward and now I'm a director and I'm a low ranking person in my department director. And my job is to tell people to do things that they may not want to do. And so I have not had the best of relationships, best relationships because people do not want to necessarily listen to me. And I've had several opportunities to give up. I have had jobs, you know, saying, okay, you're going to have this job. No, you're not going to have this job. Several times I've had situations like that. And I had the opportunity to give up. Once I was told, you know, my, my uh, chair said he vetted me for this promotion. 50% of the people he talked to said they liked me 50 percent of the people said they did not like me in fact he told me some of the people cringed when when he brought up my name but you know what a hundred percent of the people respected me and i was fine with that i'm okay with only 50 percent of the people liking me but you know back a few years ago i was not so okay and when i would talk to other people other leaders male and female i would say how do you handle not having people like you and always i heard the same thing if if you're if you don't have enemies you're not doing anything if you're making change 
something people don't like to have happen. If you're doing something, if you're if you're making change, you're going to have people disagree with you. You're going to have people not like you. You just have to push forward. I love what I do. I love my job. I've had moments where I've I've gone home and cried and you know thinking that that I'm not going to be able to handle it and I just get up and I keep going. And I am so happy I have because you know it's it means something and I have so many students that I interact with I teach a leadership class I use much of what I have learned from from this from doing a uh, you know working at the VA from from all my experiences working on the base from all my experiences I pull that back and I'll tell you what one more thing about that getting outside of my department where where I do get positive reinforcement positive like accolades like today really does help me when I have to go through those tough times so I guess you know it's yeah. it's stereotypical women that are loud I'm loud women that are decisive and confident and commanding they're they're not necessarily liked in the real world and I'm okay with that and, um, and anyway, I, anyway, I mean, when you do things, when you have to take decisions, and when you are in a, in, in a male ambience, when you somehow you need to uh, to to get the respect, you need uh, to act a little bit a little bit like them. And you know, uh, when you do a lot, like you have been doing a lot, when you are achieving a lot, well, be reassured that you cannot have hundred percent of people liking you, for many obvious reasons. And maybe today, if you're not done or gone through what you have and how you have done this with your mistakes or learnings which makes which make of you who you are today and why by the way you're here today but that's that's really a, that's really mainly a, mainly the reason and um, um, tell me how do you feel then well you know of course we are uh, we are uh, happy, so happy and so enthusiastic to, to hand over this uh, this this iconic prize to you which is which is fantastic you are now a symbol so you have been talking about who liked you who don't like you but this is a fact which we talked about the the, uh, the program i woman global awards we said everything is transparent is the only uh, program and this is why we support it by the way so how does it feel to get this uh, today you've been listing all uh, the uh, the steps in your lives which is which are just so amazing which have been uh, not easy so how does it uh, how just does it feel for you to uh, to receiving this this, this prize today this award this recognition so, um shocked i'll be, i'll be very honest with all of you i was shocked um when when Mankesh first suggested that you know he wanted to nominate me and i looked at last year's winners and their accomplishments and i said don't nominate me save your nomination for somebody that really has done a lot and he's like trust me terry you know it, you're living it so they even you may not see it but we see it and it's like if you all right all right fine and then i really just kind of let it go because i thought there was no way i was going to win and i remember waking up and seeing the email where where he said i won and i just couldn't believe it and i still think i look at all the other people and think yeah i don't believe belong there i don't fit and i'm really a confident person yeah you know, it's 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 not like me to feel like i'm inferior to anybody but when i looked at all those other women i definitely feel like i have not done enough and i think mangesh is going to take advantage of that because he asked me then if I would, in, if I would, uh, you know, have a few interns, men, that if I'd mentor some interns and and do some other things. So I think he is trying to help me um, give back, so that I do feel that I'm I'm equal to that to that award, because I, I don't yet feel that I'm equal to that award, and I'm I'm so happy to have received the award, uh, and I hope at some point in my life that I feel like I deserved that award. You definitely deserve if you if you if you're here you definitely deserve so um well, the, the fantastic thing is that you you feel like you want to share it's super important i think that um, life has given us the chance to learn and sometimes life has also forced us to learn by the experiences by you being in your car stuck for 10 hours maybe there was also a sign i'm sure that there is some good that that has come out of this and sometimes you the doors close one way is because they open up somewhere else so all makes us all these steps make us 
where we are today and this is the way that you can share and give this dream this great dream to others so um yeah i think it's fantastic maybe if you can give some more tips and messages you would like to uh, to share with any audience who's there uh, for you today with us and for you today what would you like what would you like to say to you you know conchetta you mentioned about about your own journey just briefly and i want to hear more but it made me think that you probably have some similar experiences like you said about when one door shuts do you know how many times when one door shut and i would go home and somebody would say to me ah oh, but another door is going to open and i thought they have no idea what they're talking about it, it's not my life's over okay maybe i'm being dramatic but at the point where your life feels like it's you know it's not you know it's pretty low and somebody says oh there'll be more opportunities you don't believe it necessarily there has not been one single instance where that has happened to me and i wasn't better off for it not one and i have had several i mean i mentioned a couple but there's been quite a few times where i've wanted to give up and i've thought about just you know leaving academics or or you know do, stopping some of the many things i do and um and i've never regretted not giving up and one thing i do want to share because you mentioned about the 100 percent is i'm sorry my phone's ringing <sighs> i stopped my cell phone i turned off everything else but didn't I turn <laughs> on my office phone um i wish i could have thought about it i was that's my bat phone you know that's that's I, but no it's it's my work phone um the one thing i want to share that i think is the biggest takeaway and i shared this with my three girls yesterday um, my three interns um is i i do so many different things i cannot give a hundred percent i cannot give a hundred percent to my students my academics my government my military i cannot I, it's just not possible so when you get me you get me at 80%. I'm going to make I'm going to make mistakes. I'm human. I'm going to make mistakes because my mind is on these five other things, but I'm trying to do this. It's okay to make mistakes. And as long as you own it, you know, I know I'm only going to give 80%. I know you're going to find, you know, that I that I left out a letter when I'm texting and or or doing different things or you know drop the ball when it comes to a meeting because I'm human and I can only give 80 percent and sometimes less and sometimes more but it's never going to be a hundred percent in anything I do and when I shared this with a colleague because I made a huge mistake uh with, with something he said I would rather have Terry Orzi at 80 percent than anybody else at a hundred percent so uh, so I think my takeaways would be, you know, don't give up. If a door closes, a better one usually does open. Good. And, <laughs> and understand that you cannot be there for everybody and do everything um, 100%. So yeah, that's it. I really am just a simple person. I've had a lot of good luck. Um, and and I don't really know what else to say about it. Oh yeah, well maybe you know we talked about um, we talked about you know the period that we're we are living. I mean this period in in life is is never happened before. I mean I don't know. You see, it's not just by chance. Uh, uh, you know, it's ju just very briefly, and then and then I I would like to to ask you the same. I have my 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 company. Of course, with the uh, with the lockdown and everything, I was forced to close. I mean, this is my you know this is my money maker. This is what feeds my family. So when you're obliged to close, I mean, it's either you just uh, you bear it and you say, "Oh, poor me, what am I going to do?" Well, that's maybe the majority of people that I don't I don't criticize. And then there are the doers, those who are liked or not liked, or maybe 50 percent liked or disliked. But we are entrepreneur. We have to reinvent ourselves every time. So it's either you, we are not there by saying, so I'm sure that Terry, if I ask you the same, you're not just there saying, okay, well, I cannot go to work anymore. I have to, I had to reinvent. 
Well, Willow Tribe was born because of the pandemic, because I was forced, instead of running like crazy, to stop and say, okay, well, wait a moment, this is, can be finished in, in just a second, everything can just go, and we don't know when people are, are dying, and then what is this? So let me focus, and let me see if there is not something that I always wanted to do and give back to the uh, to the community, to the universe. I mean, when I see the impact that this, uh, this has created that, and today, definitely was out of the very bad thing, you know, was a uh, was a good thing. So it's difficult financially, it's difficult financially for everyone, but at least it's a fantastic project, an inspirational one that will help women, will be also a, 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 a platform for the women of the IE Women Global Awards. And this is a platform of sharing, because if you don't share, you don't give hope, but what about you? How, what were the reflections, you say, with the, with the pandemic and everything we're living? If you had to say what this has brought you more or less uh, with, the, with what we're living? Well, contrary to what people may think, um, I'm a bit of an introvert. So I, I have enjoyed working from home. Um, up to a point, like this past week, I've, I've been coming back to work. But I'm one of the very few that can work from home uh, because I teach and, and so I'm online teaching. I've been able to speak to people, you know, all around the world giving talks because I've now learned how to use Zoom and, what, and yeah. um, WebEx and, and all, these, all these tools that I would never have used before. And, and it's helped our department because we're able to bring our, all of our adjuncts from around the country to events that would have never, they would have never been able to attend. So for us, it has, has been um, a blessing. Now, luckily we had an online track, so we were able to transition well academically. Um, but more to the problem, I practice um, making decisions without bias. That's my thing. Uh, it's, it was part of my doctorate work and it's like my philosophy on life. So how do you make decisions without bias when people are dying, when people are getting sick? Um, it, it's that whole, you know, just, just give me the facts, just give me the facts. And unfortunately, you have to, you have to operate that way because of the stress put onto those crisis decision makers. And they just have to be single focused because if they get caught up in making decisions because, because of how it's affecting everybody else outside, it's gonna to be too much. It's gonna be emotional overload. So they have to make decisions based off the facts. They have to make decisions based off the science. And I think the best thing is for us is to prepare and to plan and to educate and to safeguard ourselves, our community, our family, um, by doing what we need to do. And what that means for everybody, different people, I don't know. Now, like like you said, you reinvented yourself. I I, I think I've, I've probably reinvented myself 10 times over my career. And there's it's great, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, it, it's, it gives you like this new perspective. And so it, it's like new energy. I love it when when I do it, but it's never done because I think. I mean, it's it's just either organically it happens organically, or it's forced upon me due to barriers. And and I'm again, I, I've never regretted it. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, absolutely, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Do you think that your uh, maybe your military background has made it easier for you than for others to uh, you know to. Uh, well, kind of adapt to a very, very difficult situation. You know, we have, uh, we have, uh, for instance, we have developed really a platform of mental health because all these, uh, you know, these digital connections, this virtual connection can be, uh, they're not never easy, but they can be easier for, uh, for, uh, for, for some. If you look at the children, for instance, of the online teaching has been very, very difficult and sometimes even impossible for, uh, for many of the children to even have access to the knowledge so very, very, deep, very, very, very hard. In fact, on your, you know, on your mind and on your body. Do you think that because of your past, because of your experiences, and also, you know, learn to become as strong as as men? Do you think this was maybe a, an easier, an easier path for you? Um, be, because of this happening, did it make my path easier, or the military? 
Yes, I, I, I definitely feel um, the military made me. Yeah. If I did not have the military experience and had gone straight into college, I would not be the person I am today. Not even close. Um, it's it was it was a wonderful experience, and I think that everyone should have an opportunity to uh, to do that to get to give back to your country, give back to your community, whatever you can do. Live outside yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, um, Terry. Maybe before we close, anything that you would like to uh, to still to address to ask the audience. Uh, I don't know if we have questions, maybe from the uh, from the um, from the audience, or uh, there is anything else that you would like to uh, to share with us, uh, Terry. I, I I write fiction. <laughs> Did I mention <laughs> that? I have a few fiction books. Uh, you know, they say write what you know. And so my yes. book's about a, a female special FBI special agent. She's, well, you know, she's a little emotional. She makes decisions, you know, that she should not necessarily make. And um, so it's a series, there's three books out and I'm working on the fourth one right now. So. Wow. wow. She tracks down terrorists. It's, it's great, it's high energy, it's fun. It's an easy read, it's on Audible. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic okay fantastic yeah. so um oh well uh if you think you have you have shared again it's never it's never uh, it's always maybe too long or too short but i'm sure that there will be people in the audience who uh, will uh, maybe be more interested in, in part of the uh, of your path that we invite all of them of course to uh, to take contact with the uh, with the platform my woman global awards and of course, so to contact the, uh, the organization that we can always share. As for my part, I mean, on the platform of Willow Tribe, who supports I Woman Global Awards, and that's why I am part of it. You are definitely one, uh, will be one of my guests. It will be a pleasure, you know, of course, to share this with, with all the women and to give an example to all these women. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to have been uh, the first one to, uh, to spend some time uh, with you, uh, Terry, today on this uh, first streaming live of the, um, of the awards for I Woman a Glo a Global Awards of 2020 edition. I really hope that you spent some good time with us and that you uh, will definitely have uh, an opportunity in any shape whatsoever to meet again. Thank you very much. And it was lovely meeting you. And perhaps I'll see you um, at the award ceremony next year. Well, who knows? I don't believe. Maybe I should do like you. I don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe I get an email from Manga, who knows? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, not only do they need, um, he, he talked to me about this earlier, yeah, they, it's not just to nominate, to be nominated for the award, but they also need brand ambassadors. Um, yes, yes. So, so if you want to step up and you want to be a brand ambassador, you know, ask us about it. And, you know, we'd be happy to fill you in and put you to work right yes okay absolutely yeah there's one last question which is coming from the platform so um any particular message you would like to give to the women entrepreneur who are of course uh, stuck in this pandemic uh, period of course you can you can give and i can give i think we can both give some tips to the uh, of course to, to the women because this is mainly uh, we are trying really to support i, I will start of course with you <laughs> I would say just, you know, get with your girlfriends and brainstorm what you can do either together or as individuals, support each other and and just try and think outside the box. Um, I, I've, I've, I've come up with a few inventions thinking outside the box, like um, dessert diet gum. I mean, you just, you never know, right? So just sit down and think, what would make your life easier or the people around you's life easier? And how could you make that happen? Or what could you do that could help your, you know, your community or your country? And it's the baby steps. And just, I guess if you can dream it, you can achieve it. <laughs> well, at least is, you can try. How about you? Yeah, I, you? I, you know, the motto that I, uh, by the way, 
uh, uh, Willow Tribe is uh, is uh, is there is a, there is a little story which might be interesting for the women who are listening to us. The Willow is my contact with the nature. I told you I'm in the flower business, and it's the only tree that that never breaks. It's the trees that you know when you have storms, bad weather conditions, it bends, it bows, but it never breaks. And that was a real symbol for me during this pandemic to you know to to show to the world that you know you need to adapt and you need to resist to win. And our motto is we innovate, so we reinvent ourselves. We resist, and by resisting to difficulties like the ones we are going through now, we win. So my my message as really an entrepreneur for many many years is that really you really need to be in the juice. You really need to to uh, to ask for help. You need to share. You need to share your knowledge. You need to share what you need, the support that you need. Because even if it's we are in lockdown, there will always be help organizations and people who are ready to give support not just support in knowledge but also financial support for initiatives and for purposes which are uh, which have, have, have you no know, really have a common goal a real uh, real uh, um, purpose in helping the future and giving hope back to people because this is what we need if we don't give hope if we don't restore hope and peace for people will feel lost they need directions they need some tutorial and this is I think my message to them: you really, really don't give, don't give up. Even if you have 10% of idea in your mind, is you ready enough to show up, to shut out? Definitely, that's my message. <laughs> and if we are here with Terry sharing this somehow, we also had that difficult times. We also, like you said, how many times I said I'm going to give up? This is too much. But we are here sharing, and we are giving you an award. So that made that that made. Again, your path not easy, but definitely a, a successful one because you've learned. So that's that's my message. I think Thank we're a lot much. of life, you and I. Yes. I'm glad yes. I met you today. Thank you. We need to say thank you to our friend Mangesh that made this possible. Yes. Thank yes. You, thank Mangesh. you, Mangesh. Thank you, Mangesh. Thank you very much, uh, dear Terry, and uh, I'm really, really happy, and I'm sure we will stay in connection in any way whatsoever we could help each other and then i was really honored and very very happy to share and spend this lovely time with you thank you so much and thank, thank you to you. everybody listening to us thank you bye bye